A reading from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall, not be, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said one to another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. To God be the glory for the wonderful things that God has done, for that that we anticipate God to do in this preaching hour, 
And even for that, God is doing right now. What a mighty God we serve. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to be here with you today. This is my first time having the pleasure, Wilshire, even as I understand that the connections between Wake Forest University School and Divinity and Wilshire Baptist Church are long and they're deep. Throughout the life of Wake Divinity, Pastor George Mason and this congregation have proven wonderful supporters of our learning community and of our alums. Whether it's sending your own to Wake Divinity, like the brilliant Cameron Mason Vickery, <laughs> or whether it's welcoming a stream of pastoral interns through the residency program, like Jenna Sullivan, this church means so much to Wake Forest University. Conversely, I would also say that as dean, I pray that this church will continue to feel the same way about us. We want to prove ourselves as good stewards of your investment, your prayers, your commitment to our community. We want you to know that we remain committed to fostering agents of justice, reconciliation, and compassion. We remain dedicated to shaping the next generation of architects of hope, equity, and healing. And we want you to know that by investing in us, you are serving your own interests because we hope to be a place that will produce the sort of graduates that who knows, your next pastor might be from the imprimatur of Wake Forest University. <laughs> And we would therefore praise God for the mutual support that we offer one another. So Wilshire Baptist Church, on behalf of the faculty, the administration, the students of Wake Forest, I say to you, thank you. We've heard the scripture, both from the Hebrew Bible as well as the New Testament. And with the few minutes that I have left, uh, I told the ministry staff, I want to make sure that my sermon is finished before you think I'm done. <laughs> Tripping over our tongues. Tripping over our tongues. Please join me in prayer. Lord, I need your help. Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday. The term Pentecost literally means 50. For as recorded in the second chapter of Acts, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, something extraordinary happens. The apostles are in an upper room, gathered with other followers of Jesus. They're in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, this high and holy city that's a center from Jews through, for Jews throughout the diaspora. Jerusalem, it was home of the second temple for the previous five centuries, and believers from throughout the Roman Empire would descend upon the city. Followers from Israel, Egypt, and Italy followers of varying ethnicities and previous religious identities, those who had embraced the teachings of Judaism known as proselytes or God-fearers. And on this day, 
50 days after God had rolled the stone away, once again, God shows up. The Holy Spirit shows up like a mighty rushing wind. The Holy Spirit touched the tongues of this diverse group of followers to the degree that despite their different dialects, they could all understand one another. Some thought they were drunk. Others thought they had gone mad, but Peter proclaims, this is what had been declared through the prophet Joel, slave and free, men and women, Jew and Gentile. God promised to pour out God's spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They shall see visions and dream dreams. The Holy Spirit stitched these unique fabrics of identity into a precious quilt of what Howard Thurman calls beloved community. And this is the reason that some theologians argue that this was the day that the Christian church was born. For it is the story of Pentecost that had the potential to make Christianity unique in the ancient world. For so many faith traditions were defined and determined by tribal identity. There was a clearly defined cosmos, our world, over against a troublesome and terrifying cause, chaos, their world. There was the ceremonially pure us versus a morally deficient and defiled them. This is why religion in the ancient world, like tribes, operated from an a priori position of competition, not connection. They erected boundaries rather than bridges. They sought to defend and defeat, not affirm or uplift the presumed other. But with Pentecost, the book of Acts offers an alternative vision. Despite the ethnic and cultural differences and that imperial leaders often sought to exploit, the Holy Spirit has the power to connect a disparate humanity into beloved community. The Holy Spirit, if we are willing, has the power to transform us together in such a way where we can sing, it's no longer I, but it's you and me. No more them or they, but it's us and we. That's the power and the potential of Pentecost. Oh, I use the word potential here with great intention. For I understand that we as human beings, we as Christians, we're fickle and fragile creatures. I understand that we too often are animated more by our fears than by our faith. And I understand that it's often easy for us to take comfort in our own biases and bigotries as a way to elevate and enrich our own egos. Some philosophers would argue that this is the human condition. This is our human penchant and our predilection. It's what philosopher Pierre Bourdieu famously describes in his book title, Distinctions. A symbolic system of power relations where we take our own particular tastes and our own preferences and we use them to establish superiority over others. Oh, we sing hymns at our church. (laughs) All five verses of John Wesley. (laughs) Not that tacky, repetitive worship music. Okay. We have a majestic multi-million dollar pipe organ, not those cretinous rock and roll instruments. Okay. 
Well, we speak in tongues at our church, the heavenly language. We don't need you, Dean, with all that academic theology. We've got neology. We get down on bended knee, and that's all the theological education we need. Okay. <laughs> and rather than tapping into the Holy Spirit for its power to connect, rather than tapping into the Holy Spirit for it's a power to affirm diverse expressions. We weaponize our distinct tongues to claim superiority over others. And in the process, we are literally tripping over our tongues. Unfortunately, we know in history has proven that this is the aim of autocrats. This is the work of despots and demagogues. For the most violent and divisive expressions of Christianity across the globe seeks to, seek to exacerbate and demonize human difference. Oh, they don't teach the story of Pentecost, unique and distinctive tongues as a source of human connection. No, they reframe the story of Babel as a source of God-ordained division. Hence the reading we heard this morning from the book of Genesis, a story where humans come together to exert their will. They seek to build a tower to heaven, and as a punishment, God separates humans and gives them unique tongues so that they can no longer communicate one with another. Well, for much of the 20th century, Wilshire, this story, it's particularly in the United States, was not taught as an ideology or as an origin myth as to how people were spread across the world. Oh, an ancient myth that has many shared characteristics with similar tales throughout the ancient world. Nor was this story taught primarily as a critique of Babylon by captive Hebrews, which we have evidence to demonstrate. It was a critique because as Babylons, they were, Babylonians, they were known for their vast tall structures and importing enslaved labor, including the Jews, to build these tall structures. No, that's not how this story was taught. For much of the 20th century, this story was taught from pulpits across this country to defend Jim Crow and racial apartheid. In Stuart Landry's popular mid-century pamphlet, he argued that those seeking integration were seeking to rebuild the Tower of Babel as the title of the pamphlet. God separated the races for a reason, and that meant for us that we should remain separate. And in a line from the pamphlet that has made its way into contemporary replacement theory doctrine of white Christian nationalists, Landry states outright, I quote, Race mixing that leads to racial intermarriage is a crime against the future of the white race. He goes on to say, on the same theory that all men are brothers, we will then begin to mix with the Chinese, East Indians, and more Africans. And since there are twice as many colored people as there are whites, religion as we know it will disappear. We will have no more Christianity. Now, Wilshire, you and I can scoff at the ludicrous nature of such claims. We can dismiss the erroneous conflation of whiteness with Christianity. We can reject the fallacious claims to European moral superiority. Yet we cannot deny that such a view of the world continues to hold great purchase with a critical mass of our society. Nor do we have to look much further 
the nightly talk show pundits or manifestos by seemingly every other mass shooter from Charleston to Buffalo to find evidence of such masculine insecurity and racialized fears. Those who are tripping over their own tongues of cultural anxiety and false claims of supremacy. Last week, Wilshire, I was reading a story of a counselor in Buffalo, Wyoming. His name is Bill Hawley, and he's a prevention specialist for the county public health department. Mr. Hawley himself is a recovering alcoholic, and he's trying to help men. This is the task of the public health department in Wyoming. He's trying to help men reconsider their conception of what it means to be a man because they realize that according to the mythology of the Western frontier, being a man means being stoic and tough. Being a man is having a dominant power over career, over women, over children. Being a man, according to this mythology, is being able to display power to make others notice and tremble like John Wayne walking into a saloon. But according to public health researchers, it's this very conception of manhood as power over that's literally killing American men, particularly white men. In 2020, men accounted for 79% of all suicide deaths across the United States. Of nearly 50,000 people who died at their own hands in 2020, 70% were white men, though white men only make up 30% of the American population. And even though white men are overrepresented in upper income brackets, position of power and authority, deaths of despair, that's to say suicide, addiction, and acts of violence are steady on the rise. This is why counselors like Mr. Hawley attempt to heal men by connecting them with their feelings, by teaching them how to connect with others. For like the queer black writer James Baldwin taught us, Mr. Hawley understands that the reality of toxic masculinity, he understands that many of us cling tightly to our anger, our rage, and our hate because in the words of Baldwin, when we release ourselves of these things, we're forced to deal with our own pain. Hence, we hide behind guns, we hide behind bravado, we hide behind judgments of others. And these outward displays constitute proverbial beards that we use to hide the traps of our tears. Viewing the ultimate goal of life, my friends, as a competition to be won rather than a collaboration to be celebrated is literally kidding, killing us. And again, to quote James Baldwin, these are the lies that we fear that we cannot live without, but we now understand we cannot afford to live within. We're tripping over our own tongues. But Wilshire Baptist, we see a different vision in the story of Pentecost. Pentecost can remind us of the Holy Spirit's potential. It can remind us as Christians of our potential. Pentecost can remind us that our strength, our value, and our virtue is in our diversity. Pentecost can remind us that a protectionist and defensive posture of fear and xenophobia short circuits our capacity to uplift and even empathize with others. Pentecost can remind us 
of the words of the great Baptist hymn writer, John Fawcett. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear. And often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is that love that comes from above. Let's celebrate, Wilshire, the human ties that bind us. And stop tripping over our own tongues. <laughs>